It's been a pleasure working with the Ukrainian Institute and I hope we'll have many more opportunities to work together again in the future. I'll now hand over to Lucy Gallup, Professor of History at the University of Cambridge and a Fellow of Murray Edwards College, who will moderate the discussion this evening and introduce our panellists. I hope you'll enjoy it. We, we have a really special part of today's evening, um, uh, which is the result and, uh, and the celebration of the Ukrainian Institute London Translation Prize which has given us some wonderful and up-to-date new translations of Lesia Ukrainka's work. Uh, so, um, Olesia Komechuk is going to come to the stage and talk us through the prize. Olesia. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, good evening. Um, thank you so much for coming here tonight to celebrate Lesia Ukrainka with us. Tonight, we are delighted to hold this event in partnership with the British Library. My name is Alessia Kromachuk and I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. And the Ukrainian Institute London is a charity that is dedicated to strengthening Ukraine's voice in the UK and beyond through events and through projects that discuss Ukrainian history, current affairs, culture, and of course, literature. And Ukrainian literature is very diverse and truly exciting, but it doesn't always reach the audiences that it deserves, and partly because of the lack of translations, in particular into English. And that's why in 2021, we decided at the Institute to um, start, set up a translation prize, um, Ukrainian language, uh, Ukrainian literature um, in translation prize, which we really hope to award annually. Um, and to bring Ukrainian authors to readers around the world. And we are extremely grateful to the jury uh, members um, who um, selected the winners uh, from over 30 submissions. Uh, I'd just like to mention them. It's Sasha Dagdale, Helena Hring, and Oyem Blacker. And it's my great pleasure to announce that this year's translation prize uh, celebrating Lesya Ukrainka's 150th anniversary is awarded to Nina Mori. She's going to join us on stage in a minute. I'll just introduce her. Nina was born and raised in Ukraine in the city of Lviv. She holds degrees in linguistics and creative writing. She is the author of numerous poetry collections, so she's a poet herself. And her translations from Ukrainian include Oksana Zabushko's Museum of Abandoned Secrets and Oksana Lutsishina's Ivan and Phoebe, which is coming out uh, later this year, or probably next year, so keep an eye um, on that as well. And this year's translation prize was made possible thanks to the generous donation of the Institute's great friend and supporter, Lesia Skori. And I'd like to invite both Lesia and Nina on stage so Lesia can award the uh, prize to Nina. introduce her translation to you and read it and she'll be joined by one of the jury members <laughs> thank you so very much um, this, this means a lot um, and it means so much to have Dr. Zabrushko here as well please if you have not read the Museum of Ben Secrets or your ad could go here go on Amazon and pick them up we do not have the play memorized yet uh, but we, we do have to tell you that the the excerpt that I translated is from Cassandra and it's a lovely play and I after I did this excerpt I kept translating it and I'm not done yet but it is really a lot of fun. You probably have heard of Cassandra, you know the myth, you know Iliad, Troy is under siege, this has been going on for 10 years, things are going from bad to worse. Cassandra keeps predicting bad things and then they happen. <laughs> Cassandra is also a princess. She is the daughter of the king. Um, at some point, her brother, one of her brothers, makes a last-ditch effort at the military alliance. And by having Cassandra betrothed to a nearby king of Lydia, uh, to which Cassandra says, oh, you did. That's what she says. And um, the Lydians come, 
Um, Cassandra sees that this is going to go badly, but nonetheless they go into battle. It ends badly. Things are not going very well. Her other brother, Helenus, there are a lot of siblings. Helenus is also a seer, a prophet, who attempted to save the situation at some point. Uh, but basically it all went not very well. And this is Helenus and Cassandra. Helenus, thank you. <laughs> Helenus and Cassandra having a conversation. All right, so now we'll run the English version. <clears throat> Don't speak to me of slithering. That's not savvy, that's disgusting. Be honest, brother. Tell me as you can. Did, did you for a moment there believe from watching birds or innards or whatever that match to be our choice deliverance and the Lydians to bring it? That's quite a puzzle, sister. To be honest, I did believe it. And then I also didn't. I don't understand. <laughs> well, at first, when I saw the Lydian force, spear bristling, numberless, full-hearted, fresh and keen, I did feel certain that the Greeks, exhausted by the siege, war-weary, could not hold out against the king who thirsts for battle. And this I know too. If we had put our faith in Helen's hand, or Polyxena's, or any other woman's, but not yours, we would have won the day. Do you mean to say that all misfortune is Cassandra's fault? Not all of it, but most. <laughs> Brother. You asked for honesty. I gave you what you asked. But sister, please, I do not believe you. You cannot help it. Gods are the ones to blame for giving you the gift of seeing and denying the gift of marshalling the truth. Whenever you are visited by visions, you wring your hands, the terror petrifies you, as if the Gorgon caught you in her sight. You alarm the people. You make the truth more scary than it is. And folks lose their heads, or act without heed. And when they perish, you say, I told you so. Well, what would you do? What I've been doing. I wrestle truth. I hope to rein it in, to captain it. What about the Moire? Their will compels the world. But you would change it? Not so, Cassandra. The Moira made it so there's the sea, the ship upon it, and the storms and rocks, the captain in the harbour, hope among the struggle, victory, the truth of course, but also not the truth. Then it is also quite the sign that there be a Cassandra. And the Hellenes to fight her. This is the truth I see. I am here to free Troy from the sand bank where it's mired thanks to Cassandra's truth. And you would free it? with your not the truth. What's the truth and what is not? People call whatever lies the chance to pass the truth. I had a slave who told me my killix had been stolen, while in fact he didn't feel like looking for it. But while the slave delayed, someone did come and steal the cup. So, where's, so what was true and when? A razor's edge divides the truth and lies in hindsight, and in the moment we have nothing. When someone speaks the words they don't believe themselves, that's clearly not true. And what if the speaker is an error but doesn't know it? Would that make it true? But then how do you ever tell them apart? I don't. I let them be. What are your prophecies? What do you tell the people? I tell them what they need to hear. <laughs> what is useful. What makes them proud. That. rendition, uh, you get that wonderful sense of the freshness there of the language, especially in this new translation. Very exciting to see it and we hope to see the full, the full staging at some point uh, in, in the not too distant future. So I, I'm turning to Sasha to tell us a little bit more about Lesia Ukraika and her suffering from tuberculosis. How did that shape her, her life and her writing? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there is a uh, uh, definition of Lesia Ukrainka that we keep uh, repeating and we keep being angry about. Uh, a description given to her by Ivan Fremko, another iconic uh, writer in Ukrainian pantheon, uh, who described her as this uh, weak 
and sickly girl who is nevertheless the only man in Ukrainian literature, uh, which probably was not the compliment he thought it was, because Lesya Ukrainka was uh, uh, obviously she suffered from tuberculosis of the bones, which rendered her life very difficult. She had to seek treatment in various um, um, warmer climates. She traveled a lot. Um, she was quite unsettled uh, by that. She suffered physically, uh, but nevertheless, and I think you can uh, get the idea from this taste of her poetry, she was a very powerful poet. Uh, I think it was um, Daniel Harms who said that one must write poems in such a way that if one threw a poem into the window, the pain would break. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of poetry that Lesio Klinka gives us. Um, she is a feisty, a fiery uh, writer. It's not for nothing that her um, uh, a collection of her writing in English uh, was called The Spirit of Flame. Uh, this, I think, characterizes her much better than this weekly sickly girl, uh, who is the only man in Ukrainian letters. Uh, uh, this woman writer was also invested in the idea of uh, women's empowerment. Uh, as Oksana beautifully explained, she sort of turned around these key European plots, key European myths, um, and uh, revised them in such a way that women became uh, central figures. Cassandra, who is this tragic and marginal prophetess, never to be believed, uh, becomes the truth-sayer. Uh, she gets center stage in this drama. Uh, in her other beautiful uh, poetic drama, uh, Stone Host or Stone Master, uh, which is uh, a rewriting of the legend of Don Juan, uh, the legendary seducer and the fan offender of women from a woman's point of view. Uh, she again makes uh, Donna Anna, his prey, uh, the central figure. And in the end, it is Donna Anna uh, who changes the life, the destiny of Don Juan, and uh, not the other way around. Uh, so you can see that uh, her suffering of uh, her suffering, her physical pain, although shaped her life, should not shape our reception of her. Mm -hmm. And probably there is a way in for uh, studies in medical humanities, for example, to look at this, to look at how she coped with her condition, uh, which role it played in her writing. Mm -hmm. um, but without, you know, victimizing mm. the writer who mm. had such a powerful voice mm. and whose um, accomplishment it is to give voice to the voiceless. Mm. Yeah, thank you. So that, that kind of trope, that model of the, of the, the genius, tuberculosis actually often went with that model, didn't it? Mm. And yet she was a feisty, a feisty writer, a funny writer. T tell me, Sasha, what what was their reception at the time? Like, what role did she play in Ukrainian letters? And on, in an ongoing sense, what has been the uses of her writing? Uh, well, during her time, I think uh, in her correspondence, she complains at some point that uh, she's a writer who is revered but not read, not mm -hmm. read properly. Uh, I think she was so much ahead of her time that it was difficult for her contemporaries to appreciate her in the way she actually deserves. Um, her poems were more popular um, than her poetic dramas, for example. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that the themes that she approached were deemed exotic. Um, in Ukrainian movement at that time, uh, it was uh, more common to approach uh, more populist subjects. And Lesya Ukrainka, uh, instead of writing about you know, rural life and uh, the themes that were a bit more widespread in the populist movement. Uh, she approached these plots of high European culture, Don Juan, Cassandra, Trojan War, War uh, early Christianity, etc. And all this was deemed exotic, so uh, some time uh, passed before uh, this approach was properly appreciated. Um, she is a very ironic writer, and we get this sense of irony from her letters more than from um, 
Well, actually, no, that's not true. She is very ironic in her poetic dramas as well, <laughs> and in her prose works. But reading her letters is a pleasure, uh, because she obviously, in private conversation, allows herself to be um, more ironic, freer. Um, she always makes fun of her contemporaries who uh, expect her to, you know, uh, even more stereotypically Ukrainian. Uh, she makes fun uh, of her censors. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to to uh, get this perspective on her, you know, inner life. Yeah. And you say that she wasn't very widely read. She was sort of ahead of her time. I wonder if we can put her in that kind of that literary space of the new woman, because she was writing around the same time as Olive Schreiner. George Edgerton, Mona Kedd, uh, all these kind of famous new women writers who were, like Lesia Ukrainka, were really like probing, not just at this question of nation and Ukraine and Ukraine status, but women's intimate lives, some quite intimate material. Do, do you see her as a new woman, either, either of you? Uh, definitely. Uh, she approached this subject in her um, Articles. Uh, she wrote a beautiful article about new drama where she discussed Ibsen, for example, and uh, other these developments that were um, happening in Fantasy Actor Theatre at that time. So the new woman is definitely a figure she thinks about. Uh, and concerning like this uh, inner life of women, I think we've got a taster of this from the reading that preceded this conversation. Uh, her letters to her fellow writer, fellow new woman writer, Olga Kobylanska, uh, they reveal this search for uh, a different language in which women can escape the prison of masculinist, patriarchal um, linguistic standards. They're looking for something new, they're looking for something that uh, can convey their very intimate experience. Um, and I think it's uh, worth translating those letters, the, the entire corpus of those letters, for mm -hmm. us to understand what kind of struggle it was for women 100 years ago to find that language that did not limit them, that did not, you know, put them into the oppressor's prison, mm -hmm. in a way. Oksana, I, I introduced you at the beginning as somebody who has something of the same kind of uh, incredible range as Lesia Ukrainka, so maybe we can just push on that a little bit more and you can tell us the kinds of inspiration that you've drawn from Lesia Ukrainka in your writing. Uh, well, you know, since my adulthood, she's been my role model, And uh, in many ways, she has shaped uh, my identity as a woman writer. I, uh, um, I did not have to struggle, uh, you know, with things uh, that have been obvious already for her, uh, who is uh, four generations behind me, uh, you know. So uh, it's important, you know, to have this giant mother behind you or grandmother of grand grandmothers for that matter mm, and uh, yes it is um, it is a constant dialogue uh, you know that you have with this role model when you have one uh, and uh, I would say even in, in case I'm I'm really reading her most of the uh, dramas by heart, you know, since, since my uh, young uh, young years, and and it is uh, like some constant discoveries, uh, not only by letters, uh, which nowadays read uh, I don't know like like blogs or like some kind of, it's been a substitute uh, for the social networks uh, in this very epoch period, writing five or six wonderful long letters daily to your friends and relatives. And uh, I think 
um, that I even think that we owe a lot to her purple Velasquez because it, um, it's been um, um, due to her forced isolation in this magic mountain of the time. You know, Pergolosis, climatic resorts, yeah, go and read from a smart magic mountain. He has uh, written a lot about the condition of this, uh, you know, upper, upper middle class uh, of time who had to spend years and years uh, at the climatic resorts. Uh, but uh, if she were perfectly healthy and came in Ukraine. Um, I mean, her, uh, her energy uh, of a public person, her temperament of a public activist, which is so visible in her writings, would have stolen, I am afraid, most of her working time uh, that went uh, into this 21 book long dramas. Uh, so, so I see her as rather as a brother, as kind of a forced uh, writer's residency, left me for some, for about a decade or something. And in many ways, she is our contemporary. Uh, and uh, I think it is a big uh, loss for my Western um, fellow writers, especially for my women writers, women counterparts in the West, uh, that they don't have the full picture of. Uh, European women literature of mm -hmm. the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Without the Sokratinka, it will never be complete. There is a huge hole mm -hmm. in my perception. There is a huge hole in all Western uh, literary histories of the 20th century century written about women, um, the whole which should be uh, liquidated by introducing Lady Ukrainka's work to the Western audience in full scale. It's really necessary without this women writing in the 21st century, uh, we'll always be missing something without the author of seven. Well, that gives us a great kind of vision, doesn't it, of how we might be rethinking Europe, but also provincializing Europe and thinking about uh, the interactions between Europe and, and the non-European world. And I, I, I wonder, Oksana, if you could tell us what do you think um, Leslie Ukrainka's travels did for her, uh, for her perspective? And I'm particularly interested in the, the time she spent in Egypt and the interest she took in Arab culture and Egyptian culture and where that fitted into her kind of over. Oh, yes, yeah, thank you very much for that question. Uh, uh, well, to begin with, uh, I think we have forgotten to mention that she was fluent in 10 languages. Including Greek and Latin, which was uh, unusual for <laughs> the women's education of the time. Uh, this she owed to her mother, who gave her very, uh, well, very meticulous domestic education, and uh, so she was having Greek and Latin and uh, eight European languages. Uh, so she was reading, um, uh, she, she was very much open to all the trends uh, of uh, European literature and 
uh, European uh, ideas of her time. She was interested in philosophy. She was doing very serious authors research uh, for every historical drama she was taking up. So, um, so she. Um, I think was a part of a European culture, even regardless of the traveling. But but also her travel books, I would say, that she left in her letters are extremely interesting because yes, I mean it's Belle Epoque. It's the kind of very rapid changes, and I appreciate you know the frame, uh, the, this context that you've given us at the very beginning. Uh, and uh, it's amazing time within one generation, within some quarter of a century, um, uh, civilization shifting to, I don't know, telephone, <laughs> telegraph, uh, uh, electric, uh, electricity, uh, well, I mean, totally different kind of concept of urbanism, uh, and her letter from Berlin, uh, written in 1899, describing, you know, this atmosphere of newly rising metropolis, uh, like no comparison to Vienna, no comparison to Vienna, not to mention here. <laughs> uh, so, her, this, her sense uh, of uh, History. Um, her prophecies uh, about uh, the looming war, uh, like she pointed out uh, two regions which she was worried about as most troublesome the Balkans and the Caucasus. <laughs> like, uh, well, problems or decades to come. And then, you know, she was traveling to the Egypt um, in uh, like uh, years before uh, the Great War erupted, uh, before World War I, uh, and, but, which was already in the air. And her, uh, what she was arriving at the time is just permeated with this premonition of the grand catastrophe of this looming war. Well, she was very much a pre-war writer and pre-war intellectual, so she died a couple of months before the war started. Uh, and this uh, and her, uh, uh, all these reports from Egypt, all these reports on her way to Alexandria, and uh, the reports from Smyrna, the first war conflict, and everything. My God, I mean, I mean, she was choosing all these exotic things just to channel her own Cassandra's feelings, definitely. <laughs> and her interest in Egypt and her interest in the in the condition of the Egyptian woman, she started to write a story about uh, uh, about woman in uh, Egyptian Arab <coughs> woman, woman in Arab and and goodness, I mean, uh, if she were having at least you know four or five years, not more. Uh, it would have definitely read a lot of more exciting stuff on the subject because in her prose, she was, I would say, very much uh, second wave feminine. Mm -hmm. uh, when I read her prose, including uh, those drafts and those unfinished fragments, uh, with, where I completely agree with what Sasha said before, that she was too much ahead of her time to be fully appreciated. I mean, these issues just 
were not great. I mean, she was very much gender oriented, mm -hmm. and uh, and she was uh, she was doing things like no one was doing. Uh, I mean, for for as for half a century after that, like writing about the age pregnancy, you know, the psychological problems of uh, of the pregnancy of having having a childbirth after forty and uh, and menopause and and whatever. I mean, uh, so so it's re it really it's. So, you know, the pertinence for the women of my generation, even 100, even a century after. Mm -hmm. Super, thank you. I, um, I want to just uh, get everyone's minds going for questions. And while you're all uh, reflecting on what you might like to ask, uh, I'll just ask uh, Sasha, what role do you think Leslie Ukrainka plays today in Ukraine? I mean, she was an incredible writer, as you say, ahead of her time, writing in a kind of authoritarian state where there's significant amounts of censorship and unrest. The future was, was unclear. What, why would we meet her and what role does she have today? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for this question. Uh, I think that Leslie Ukrainka today, first of all, she is reappropriated by mass culture. Uh, and by protest culture in Ukraine. So um, those of you who are in the context will know what uh, uh, Maidan, uh, the Euro Maidan uh, Revolution of Dignity is, the revolution of 2013-2014, when the authoritarian regime was overthrown and uh, the president of Ukraine had to, was ousted by protesters uh, and the entire center of Kiev was basically in flames for three months. And during that period of time, um, there was a mural put up uh, next to the Institute of Literature uh, where the three iconic writers that were mentioned today, uh, Ivan Franko, uh, the author of the Cyclic Girl, uh, uh, Taras Shevchenko, who is basically like the father of the Ukrainian nation, and Lesya Ukrainka were depicted in protesters' gear. So in Ukraine, literature becomes uh, one of the ways to protest, to, you know, fight against the injustice, uh, and Lesya Ukrainka is very much prominent in this context. Mm -hmm. um, I think that she offers us a very interesting mixture of uh, various threads, like her nationalism, which is uh, civic nationalism, not ethnic nationalism, which is very much of this uh, Franz Fanon type, where you know the uh, it is the national consciousness uh, where the international consciousness grows and flourishes. Uh, her cosmopolitanism, her turn towards European cultures, yes, but also cultures of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, her engagement with uh, world literatures, her feminist, obviously. Uh, her commitment to social justice, all these threads she still holds together and she shows us how to fight for like a more hopeful, equitable world um, with her writing. Thanks, Sasha. That was really inspiring. Obviously, a worthy candidate. Thank you.